I want you to know that this room is better because you are in it. Because each of you are in it today. So thanks for being here. Thanks for being a part of this worship service. I want to encourage you to take out your bulletin. On the back side of your bulletin, there's a place for sermon notes. Maybe it's something that, I, that is said or something you see on the screen today is something that you want to take back with you. Um, during this whole series, uh, this Lent series, we've been throwing out a lot of different scripture verses, coming back to some scriptures that we've looked at before. By the way, Lena, thank you so much for being here. Was that not awesome? Thank you. So thank you. It, grateful for her and, and her ministry. And if you ever are in modern worship, you'll see Elena on video every Sunday. So um, we're grateful for that as well. So um, as she does our welcome in modern worship for us. So, but again, if on the back of your bulletin, there's, an, there's um, just a place to take notes. To, and as always, if you've missed a, a sermon or missed a, you know, um, actually today, if, actually right now, if you miss a whole the whole service. If you're on Facebook, you can actually go find it on Facebook and, and, and watch it. You know, we have, we've, we're averaging about 600 views a week um, on, on our Facebook live video of this worship service. So, um, so that, uh, God's doing a great thing with that. So we're very grateful for that. So thank you for all, always for your feedback and all of that. Today is our last sermon in this Lent season. Next Sunday we begin, we, we head into um, we head into Holy Week with Palm Sunday, and so it'll be a, a special Sunday. It'll be a great Sunday as we look at with Jesus as he made his way into Jerusalem. So we'll be looking at that story and, and seeing what it means for us today. So, but today we're going to look at what is, it, what is the fruit of a spirit-led life, the fruit of a spirit-led life. And I want to start out by telling this story. Dorothy Fortenberry. Dorothy Fortenberry is actually a Hollywood screenwriter, and she writes for the series The Handmaid's Tale. Have y'all seen that? The Handmaid's Tale. It is. Well, Dorothy actually is a Christian, and in an essay in the Los Angeles Review, um, she explains her odd habit of going to church regularly. And this is what she says. She says this, The single most annoying thing that a non-religious person can say, in my opinion, isn't that religion is oppressive or that religious people are brainwashed. It's the kind patronizing way that non-religious people have of saying, You know, sometimes I wish I was religious. You ever had a friend say that to you? You know, I I wish I could really believe like you believe. I really wish. And and she says, and and then they will go and say, you know, it must be comforting to be a religious person. And she continues and she says, you know, I don't find religion to be comforting in the way that my non-religious friends think that religion is comforting. It's not comforting to know that to know quite as much as I do about how weak-willed I am when it comes to being as generous as Jesus demands of me. I come and I sit down next to people, well aware that we don't have everything in common, and yet we face the same direction because we're all broken individuals, united only by our brokenness, traveling together to ask to be fixed She said, it's kind of like we just stepped into a subway car together or we're sitting at the DMV together. It's a great analogy for church, sitting at the DMV office. (laughs) Four weeks ago, we started our journey together in the wilderness of Lent. And it's on this journey that we have confronted our own sinfulness. Early, early on, that first Sunday, we agreed to say no to some things. We, we agreed to say no to something so that we can say a greater yes to the things that matter. Not just to give up something, but that something we can say yes to something greater. What that does is it gives room for the Holy Spirit to work within us. Because here's the thing, if, I don't know about you, but in my life, I love to have my calendar full. My to-do list, every morning I get up and I make out my little to-do list for the day. And, and if I don't have, you know, at least 15 things on that, thing, on that list, I feel like I'm not productive for the day. And, and, but, here's, but here's the thing. If I fill up my life with my to-do list or my calendar with, with things all the time, I don't give room for God to work in my life. Do we? None of us do. Once we walked into the wilderness, 
we said we got a gap problem. A gap that existed between our expectations and the reality of our life. This is the way Paul said it. He said, you know, I don't understand my own actions. For I don't do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. And we looked at how do we close the gap between our expectations and reality. And what we said is that it's not about working harder, not about striving harder. It's really about self-identifying with Christ. We have self-identified with Christ in our baptism. We have been buried with him by baptism into death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. So Paul is telling us that baptism, baptism is actually a, a being buried with Christ. It is, it is participating in the death and resurrection of Jesus. It's dying to our old sinful self and being raised to a new creation. Therefore, remember this, therefore consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So here's, here's what we've said. So as a follower of Christ, sin no longer has control. Sin is evident, sin is present, but sin no longer has control. Death no longer has the final word. Being washed in the water and being made alive in the Spirit has given us new birth into a new creation. Jesus says in John chapter 8, verse 36, If the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. And that's what Paul is wanting the Galatians to understand. You see, he wants them to understand you don't have to add anything to the gospel. And that's what he would say to us today. You don't have to add anything to the gospel. To the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. There's nothing that needs to be added to it. And and because here's they were they were being taught that you know what? You know, if if you're a dude, you gotta be circumcised to to really truly be a follower. Or you've got to eat a certain way, or you gotta have a certain habit of eating, or you can only associate with certain people. And and then if you if you followed all of these rules, then you could be a good follower of Jesus. But Paul says, now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to the law. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. So we said last week that we are no longer slaves. We have been set free through Christ. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke. Of slavery. So here's the thing. By your baptism into the death and resurrection of Jesus, you are in Christ Jesus. You are. There is no ands or ifs or buts about it. Paul is not BSing us on this one. Can I say that in church? <laughs> He's, I mean, it's real. He, I mean, if you are buried and died in Christ and been risen with Christ, you are in Christ. Christ. Oh, Lord, I need a peppermint. <laughs> My mama might be watching that on you, Facebook. If you are in Christ, the Spirit lives in you. You're saying, so after the death and resurrection of Jesus, he ascends into heaven, and the disciples, they go into this upper room of this house in Jerusalem. Now, it's the season of Pentecost. It's actually the day of Pentecost. And it was there that the, the book of Acts tells us that the Holy Spirit fell upon the disciples that were cowering in fear and confusion and doubt. And the Holy Spirit fell on these guys. And they began to speak in tongues. And they begin to see evidence of this great move of God's Spirit. And then the first thing they do is Peter goes out and Peter begins to preach. Peter. The, the, the one disciple that was with Jesus from the very beginning, and yet the same, the same disciple who denied Jesus on three different, uh, three different times. Peter begins to preach. This is what he says. This Jesus that God raised up, and all of us are witnesses, 
being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you both see and hear. And he continues to preach and he goes through the whole Old Testament kind of telling the story of how Jesus was the Messiah that that the people were looking forward to. And and then when he gets to the end, the the people start looking around and say, well, what do we do? What what do we do with this message? What was our next step? And this is what Peter says. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven. And listen to this part. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When we became a follower of Jesus, we were gifted with the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you what that means. That means the same Spirit that that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the same Spirit that lives inside of you as a follower of Jesus. I want you to let that sink in for a moment. The same Spirit that brought Jesus back from the dead It's the same spirit that lives and reigns inside of his believers. Paul says in Galatians, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. Therefore, and this is our passage this morning, Galatians chapter 5 verse 16. Therefore, live by the spirit. I say and do I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the spirit, and what the spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious, fornication, impurity, uh, how do you say that word? Oh, it's not even up there. It's a bad word. Idolatry, sorcery. Enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I'm warning you as I warned you before. Those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, competing against one another, envying one another. That's Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 26. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 through 26. Live by the Spirit, not by the flesh. If you are led by the Spirit, Paul says, then you are not subject to the law. We've settled that. We've talked about that for the past two weeks. We're not, we're not people that we live by the Spirit, not by the law. A life lived for Christ under the Spirit is a life that is not enslaved to the law. But that doesn't mean that we can give in to the desires of the flesh. You see, we are not to give in to those things that cause harm to ourselves or harm to society. This is where the freedom, the freedom that we've been talking about is connected to what it means to live under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Because here's the thing, Christ did not set us free to be self-indulgent. Christ did not set us free to be self-indulgent. Because the focus of freedom, the focus is not on freedom from, but freedom for. We have been freed from the power of sin in order to be freed for a life in Christ. We are free, free from ourselves. We are free to be more freely loving. To be free to risk love. It's to be free For responsibility, not free from responsibility. We are free to now love our neighbor. What is it freedom from? It's freedom from ourselves. It's being liberated from that prison of me, myself, and I. 
I, I like the way one older pastor said it. He says, you know, we can tell if we're living in the freedom of Christ is if we can ask ourselves, have I cried for someone other than myself this past year? I'm not talking about an ex-boyfriend or girlfriend kind of cry. But has my heart been broken for something that has broken the heart of God this past year? And if we can say no, then we probably are still being enslaved to ourself. Paul puts it this way. When it comes to the freedom in Christ, the only thing that matters is faith working through love. Faith working through. How many of you have a Fitbit? Anybody got a fit, or you need some kind of some kind of thing that measures steps? You, you know, you know what I'm talking about. You know, you wear it on your wrist. I'm surprised that. Uh, raise your hand again, y'all. Come on, let's just confess. Okay, it's it's pretty good. I, I, I originally saw that number. Y'all, some of y'all were ashamed to put your hand up. Is what it was. I think. <laughs> well, I had one. No, I had one. I had one, and I and I loved it. I lo- but so last year we were up um, hiking, and we we're around the Etowah River, and it was really hot and. The river was there. I had to jump in, and Sharon, my wife, was like, well, you might want to take your Fitbit off. And I said, it's waterproof, but it's not rockproof. So I jump in, and I hit my arm against the rock, and it cracks it. And so I don't have one anymore. And, um, but that's a whole other sermon about not listening to your wife, but we'll, <laughs> we won't go there. So, but here's the thing about it. We like that, don't we? We like to measure success. I had 10,000 steps last week. I'm going to get 15,000 steps this week. You know, we like that. We like, and, and, and I, don't, I like it too. We all like those kind of ideas that, so we, but if we're not careful, we can, we can quickly turn our Christian walk into a spiritual Fitbit. I need a little bit more joy in my life this week. I need about 10,000 more steps of joy this week. So let me strive for that. Well, you know what? I, I, I maxed out at 20,000 ste- 20, steps of kindness this week. I'm good for like two weeks now. I, I don't have to do any kind of kindness. I, and, and don't get me wrong. I mean, it's nice to have a little reminder, especially if I lose my patience, I, you know, or if I need to show a little bit more gentleness. But if we turn our Christian walk, into a performance-based discipleship program, then we've made it more about us than it is about what God is doing through us. Here's the thing. Paul calls it the fruit of the Spirit. Did you ever notice that? He doesn't say plural, fruits. It's like one tree and it's an orange, an apple, grapes, and all of that grows on one tree. He calls it the fruit of the Spirit. And so it's not like you and I can say, well, I got the patience down, but I I lack generosity. Or I need to work on self-control, but I got kindness. You know, and because here's the thing. we Sometimes we read this list that Paul gives us as sort of a a virtue list. Uh, And I've even seen Bible studies. I've seen, you know, very prominent Bible studies who have put this together in in a way that it's it's put together like, okay, this week we're going to focus on patience. Next week we're going to focus on self-control. But but here, that's not the way Paul intended for us to read this. It's not so much read as a list of virtues as it is a portrait of a life that is being led by the Spirit. It's a portrait of a life that is being led by the Spirit of God. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control is a portrait of what a Spirit-led life looks like. They are the fruit, the fruit of a life being led by the Spirit of Christ. And secondly, (coughs) fruit is a byproduct of, of a healthy planet or planet plant the fruit of the spirit is a result of God's spirit living in us so the more we allow the freedom of Christ to have full reign of our life the more that fruit is going to mature so it's not like I got to go out here and strive harder I'm going to be more patient today if it doesn't kill me kind of attitude it is that we continue to abide in Christ we continue to sit, we, we, we stay connected to the vine. We'll get to that in a minute. But 
I don't know. In ele- we got some elementary school folks in here. They still do those elf things around Christmas time where, you know, you go into the library and you, your kids, do, you know, you go to the library and you like, you know, and they pay $5 and they get this junk stuff. They bring it back and they give it to you for Christmas. Y'all know what I'm talking about? They still do that? So he, C.S. Lewis has a great analogy of, of kind of talking about that. You know, and I remember, so if those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, so basically what happens is, is in elementary school, they, um, my son came home and he said, Dad, I want to buy you a Christmas present, but I need, I need 10 bucks. <laughs> so you give him $10, and he goes off, and he goes to the school and to the library during, the, you know, right leading up to Christmas. They have this little elf shop set up, and they can buy these gifts, and they'll have them wrapped, and they'll bring it back. And, you know, and I've got like 10 keychains with the letter J on it. So if anybody needs a keychain, Janice, you need a keychain with the letter J on it? I got plenty of them. And, and so... And so you can have those little things, and, and so, but, and you would be a fool, wouldn't you, to think that, that, that the father or the mother or the, the parent actually comes out ahead. That's what C.S. Lewis says about that. He says, you know, we would all be, but, but you're still overjoyed, aren't you? Because your child, even though he probably, he didn't have the money, he still, at least there was something in him or her that wanted to go to that shop and something in their heart that wanted to buy that gift for you, bring that gift back, and just to watch you open that gift. Listen to me. We don't bring to God anything that God has not already given to us. We don't bring to God anything that God has not already given to us. God doesn't need your love. God doesn't need your peace. God doesn't need your patience. God doesn't need your generosity. But your neighbor does. Your neighbor does. For the sake of others, God will produce fruit in you so that God's kingdom can live through you. Here's a question I hear a lot of us ask when we, when we become Christian. Okay, now that I'm saved, what must I do now that, that I'm saved? And I think that's the wrong question. I think the, the right question is, is, what work is God doing in me and through me for the sake of my neighbor? Now that I am a follower of Christ, what work is God doing in me and through me for the sake of other people? There's a story told of a man who went down to the altar every time the church held a revival. Y'all know what a revival is? You know, you know it's where we got religion once a year. And so you'd get a, a guest preacher would come in and have these week-long revivals. And, um, and so the, the story told of this fellow that every time, every time the church would have a revival service, this fellow would go down to the altar and he would just pray. And he'd pray, Lord, fill me up. Fill me up. Just like we sang, fill me up, Lord, fill me up. So he did that. And, and every year, year after year after year, until one year, apparently this one little old lady who probably needed a lot more patience, she, she got tired of hearing, hearing, hearing this man come down to the altar and saying, fill me up, fill me up. And she jumps up in the back of the church and she says, Lord, don't hear his prayer because he leaks. He leaks. You fill him up every year and he leaks. If you're like me, we leak. I'm not always joyful. I'm not always patient. I'm not always kind. But I want you to hold on to this truth. You must never underestimate what the Spirit is able to produce in your life. Don't ever underestimate. Because the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the grave is the same Spirit that lives inside of each and every one of us. So don't ever underestimate. No matter how annoying you think that mother-in-law is, God can do a mighty work in her. Don't ever underestimate what God can produce in you. In John chapter 15, Jesus says this, Abide in me as I abide in you, just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me, and I in them will bear much fruit. Because apart from me, 
you can do nothing. What we need is trust. It's not about me. It's not about you. Jesus says it's about me. I'm the vine, not you. You're the branch. My father owns the vineyard. Trust in me, and I will bear fruit through you. Let us pray. This whole season of Lent, we've been praying together the Lord's Prayer. I want to invite you to join with me, and let's pray it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into the temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.